So hello, hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Karam and I am one of the education consultants here at Education Basket. Uh, we're basically an education um, consultancy agency that helps students find the best opportunities for studying abroad. Uh, and today we're joined by Ms. Monal Hossein and uh, Professor uh, Iris uh, Lorscheid, who is Vice Rector Research and Head of uh, the Digital Business and Data Science Program at the University of Applied Sciences Europe uh, in Hamburg, uh, Germany. Um, and we'll be talking basically about data science for business and what it means uh, exactly. Uh, so please note that this session is being recorded and will be available on our social media platforms and those who attended will be receiving uh, a certificate of attendance. Uh, we'll also be having a Q&A session at the end of this webinar uh, to answer all your questions. Um, so um, first off, uh, just to introduce Professor Iris, uh, she holds diploma degrees in computer science and administrative science as well as a doctorate with highest distinction uh, in computer science from Hamburg uh, University of Technology. Uh, Professor Iris is elected member of the management board of the European Social Simulation Association. Um, she's also uh, editorial board member of the Journal uh, of Article Societies and Social uh, Simulation and reviewer in various established international scientific journals. Uh, Professor Iris is an expert in the field of data science and agent-based simulation uh, with a focus on the analysis of social systems and data-based uh, theory de development. Um, uh, so now I would like to invite you, uh, Professor Iris, to talk to us about uh, data science uh, for business. Yeah, thank you so much for the nice introduction and hello everyone from wherever you are right now. I hope that you are healthy and that you are all doing well in this crazy times. And I'm so glad that you take a moment to talk with us about data science for business. I'm at the University of Europe, as you heard in the introduction, in the beautiful city of Hamburg in the north of Germany. And I want to dig in to the topic right now. So data science, it all starts with the fact that everything that we do is now reflected in the digital world. Maybe it even starts when you get up and you set your alarm on your smartphone and when you check the news on your smartphone, you maybe let yourself entertain through your digital um, devices. So really watching TV um, rarely happens as we learned and um, whether it is about buying your clothes or buying your groceries even, so much things happens in your personal life in the digital world. So we have a lot of data that is collected about us and our personal life, which is very interesting for the businesses to learn about their customers, of course. From a business point of view, the same movement happens. So even when you look in a manufacturing line, when you go into, have a look at the supply chains, movement of material, everything can be reflected now in the digital world by having sensors and chips, so a lot of data is collected about us, human beings, the social systems, as well about the industrial processes. And because we have so many data, they are much more in this world than we are able to analyze right now. And this is what we call dark data. The, we, we collect more and more data and more and more of these data are just there and are not brought to any use yet. Um, the sheer amount of data is also driven by the form of data. We have a lot of audio files, video files, photos, videos, and all these data need to be brought to a value. And this is exactly the task of a data scientist. So in digital business and data science, we are thinking about ways how to create value from all these data that we are collecting and digitization. And this value can be about the interaction with our customers, with our business partners from the business point of view, to optimize our processes, to be more cost efficient, um, and maybe also to be better in our interaction with each other because it is more individualized and personalized. And this is what a data scientist needs to do. So a data scientist should be um, curious, should uh, have fun with analyzing data, crunching data and processes to identify where are bottlenecks, what can be improved, how can we better interact 
in the digital challenges. My program is still called digital business, but really we can get rid of digital, right? Because almost none of our businesses happen without any relation to the digital world. And because this is true, we have so much demand of data scientists. So when you go into the field of digital business or data science, you are really in demand by big data technologies and uh, by uh, firms who create these technologies, but also by every other industry because no industry and no business can act without being somehow reflected in the digital. And um, this is really a safe career path. You will not have a problem to find a job with having a degree in data science or digital business. It um, really goes across all sectors because all the sectors work digitally. And I can show you some examples what job postings might look like. And this depends whether you are more a techie kind of personality or whether you are more a business mind. When you are more a business mind, it's very important for you that you still understand the technological side. The data scientist is what Harvard Business Review said, the sexiest job of the 21st century. And I think it is true because you never really need to decide for an industry. You um, have a very general mindset and a very general expertise that is needed everywhere. And you can either go for the more tech-oriented jobs later, like really about data science or business analytics or building apps um, so that you say, okay, I want to be the one who programs the apps that are then used by businesses. It can also be something like digital manager. For example, FC Barcelona was looking for a digital manager last year who improves the digital experience of a visitor in the stadium. You can also go for software engineering if you are more an IT oriented person, or you are interested in cars and you want to improve the customer experience in a car through interaction with smartphones and car, for example. And this is what uh, Hyundai was looking for last year, a digital customer experience analyst. So how can you improve that? Then a very classical path would be e-commerce. So maybe you're using Amazon, Maybe you're using some e-commerce to buy your um, sneakers or your clothes. So maybe you want to go into this um, industry and improve the experience of customer buying the stuff in the internet. Or you want to be a product owner and a product owner can be about all the digital products that you can imagine either for the company that you're working on itself or for the outside world. Here again, um, Audi, Audi was looking for a product owner for mobility services. So the career paths are various and they are vast. And I experienced that companies want to be in contact with our students early on and the best students easily find an internship within the first two semesters. We work with very established companies like Statista. Statista is a very well-known company and they pick the best students and they already offer them internships because we have much more people that we need with this expertise on the market than we have. So how to make sense of data and how to transfer data to information. And this is the methodical expertise that you need as a data scientist. And what this field does is to try to make sense out of data by algorithms. So we develop algorithms that extract patterns based on data to understand patterns based on data and respond to that. And I brought you now some examples and some thoughts and some input on the things that we are discussing in the lectures. Actually, I brought you some of the slides of the introduction lectures that we had this week with my students and we had great discussions. So I want to share with that with you. So first of all, we are talking about algorithms and data. This is the core and what is an algorithm? Well, this is an algorithm. This algorithm sorts just a list of data. So the task here is that this unordered set of data needs to be sorted. And for this, the two neighbor values are compared. And when the left value is bigger than the right one, then it is swapped. 47 is bigger than 27 is swapped. 47 is bigger than two, it is swapped. 47 is bigger than 46 is swapped, and then so on, so on. So it just has a pairwise comparison of values. And when the left one is bigger than the right one, it is swapped. 
And here you see this algorithm having just a few lines, highly formalized and doing the same over and over again, no matter how long this data set might be and how this data set might look like. So why are we using these algorithms at all? Well, they are consistent. They do the same over and over again. They do not deviate from what you coded. They are never tired. As soon as we have the energy, <laughs> it's not always guaranteed. As soon as we have the energy, they are never tired. They just go on and they are very exact. So they do not do any errors. As, I mean, as long as you are not coding any errors for them. And they are super fast. And about the speed, I want to talk with you because when we develop algorithms that learn from data and react to data, we need to reflect of what does that mean that these algorithms are so super fast. Actually, it means that these algorithms have their own universe of time. They live in an own universe of time. On the left hand, you see our human decision ecosystem in time. How much time do we need to observe something, to decide on something and to react? And we humans need hours, minutes, but at least seconds. So when you read a longer article, you need hours, maybe minutes to read just a newspaper article. Reading a character tweet, you need maybe seconds. But the limit of human decision-making is really around a second, like observing something is happening, like my class would fall down now and I need to react. I cannot act much more than a second. For an algorithm, this is nothing. I mean, this is just when it started in milliseconds, in nanoseconds maybe even. They are so much faster than we are. And what this means and why we need to take care of this as data scientists is what I want to show you now with an example. So now you will see micro traders and these are software agents trading on the financial market. And now we see how this happened Wow, this was super fast. Did you catch that? Probably not. Let's have a look again. Wow, this is how fast algorithms work. We have no idea what just happened and this is our human observation. So let's bring the thing that happens with the algorithms in human time dimension. And this is what you see here. This is what happens in milliseconds. You see on the bottom, it is 9 a.m., 37 minutes and 56 seconds. And everything that happened in our real time before happens in milliseconds. And these are micro traders at work. These are little agents who trade micro. And this means that they have a teeny tiny amount of money that they gain and profit through selling and buying stuff and they do it on a very small scale but because they are so fast and they are so many it is again profitable but as you see these trading these micro trades happens only between agents and they are total in the digital world in their own time dimension and when we use algorithms and data to let them trade for us for our money let them do it for our money we need to be aware it is in their own time dimension. And when this went wrong was in 2010, the crash of 255, is it called? You can look it up. When these software trades, traders did something wrong, but when we as human being identify that something happened, the algorithms already did respond and the damage was happened. And while we were aware of something went wrong, these algorithms in their own time dimensions already had ages that passed. And this is when people lost money. And why do we consider this? And why do we discuss this in our data science and big data and analytics class is we need to be aware of that. We need to be aware when we build these digital products that they respond to customer requests and act with each other in so, fast and so few time for us that while we perceive a change, algorithm have long reacted to the developments. So alongside our lecture, we are always talking about what is possible, what can be done, what are our limits, and what do we need to take care of because we have humans who interact with these algorithms. And we trust algorithms. That's the other point. Um, for some, it might be a bit scary that everything is now digital and we have artificial intelligence in the world. I have another lecture tomorrow morning in the program on artificial intelligence and what they can do. 
but um, actually we like to trust these algorithms. A good example is the GPS system. I don't know how much you reflect upon your uh, GPS system, whether it is right when it guides you to a place that you have not been before. You just follow it, right? I was on vacation in Madeira, it's now two years ago, and we just followed the GPS and the GPS steered us to a very small, teeny tiny road, but we didn't ask whether this was a good thing or a bad thing. And then all of a sudden the road was super small and super steep. And it was horrible because our car almost didn't make it up the very steep hill. But well, we just followed the GPS. And it has a name and I want you to know this name and this is automation bias. We as people tend to have great confidence in automation. We have even greater confidence in algorithms than in our own abilities. We think Google is right, GPS is right, it's not us. And with that, our human ability even decreases and this is a capacity problem. We give our problems and decisions to the system. We think it's better than human automation bias. And we like to give it to a system. So when we build these products that react with algorithms on data and um, create consequences, we need to be very responsible with that because we know that other people rely on that fully. And one scenario where this comes really to life is a cockpit scenario in a plane. And this is why I chose this picture. And algorithms are everywhere and they prepare our decisions already to great extent. For example, it screens CVs when we apply for a job. They predefine who is a match for us and who is not on our dating apps. They are even used, for example, in the American justice system to identify predators, et cetera, by analytics. And it has a very big success stories in health where in the health area, it helps us to have specific treatments, individual treatments for people based on data. Algorithms and data help us to predict maintenance. So all our productions, all our um, sites have sensors that we can monitor data with. And then we identify when anything is out of a certain range. And before any damage occurs, we already see it reflected in data. So it's not only about the apps that we as human beings are using, it's also about monitoring and uh, helping us to understand what is happening in our industrial facilities. Also here, data scientist is needed for the apps as well as for the industry and for monitoring the processes there. And they help us to understand our customers. So analyzing the behavior of people on our web pages and our apps helps us to identify what are typical customers with typical needs. And you will um, have already experienced that when you're on Amazon and you got the recommendation that might be for you or when you're on Netflix or whatever tool you are using and the recommendations are built on the customer profiles. And from a business point of view, it makes sense to know more about the customer needs and um, we um, can sell the right product to the targeted audience. So that's another side of a data scientist. And here you already see the big variation, right? I talked about maintenance and manufacturing, and now I'm talking about apps again and customer profiles and marketing uh, topics. It's a wide area that you can develop yourself into. And what we also know when now we already spend some time on the internet and we know that the algorithm does not show us everything. So when I'm looking for something on the internet, I maybe get different results than you do. Can be because I'm in Germany and you are somewhere in the Middle East. Uh, maybe I have different preferences than you are. I'm certainly a different age than you are. So there's something and it is called filter bubble. It does not show us everything. When we were looking for a job back then or for a study program for us, we needed to go to an information center. This is what the good German information center looked like in the 70s. Well, I was there maybe a bit later, but yeah, like early, early 90s. But when you wanted to inform, uh, be informed about what is the study program that you wanted to choose, you really needed to go to these centers, had paper, had information there. Now you have this situation from early on, the whole world is accessible for you. You have an internet connection and the whole world is there for you. 
And you might think that you are very informed by that. <laughs> we already know that this is not true. We learned that a lot in particular in the recent years. When you look, for example, on Google for a keyword, uh, I put here popularity bias because this is the scientific term about what is happening. Then you find 10 results on the first page, maybe 20 results. Now let's take here the 10 results. Let's say you look for something and then you only screen the first 10 results. In this case, from the 43,800,000 results that you have, you're only looking to 10 and it is 0.00023% to of all the information. So we can, of course, not perceive all the information that is out there and not all the information is shown to us. So there's a real power in what Google shows us and what it left out on the 10 first hits. And this is why we have the ads. You saw that the already that the first results that you have are ads, they are the people paid so that these are the first results that are shown on Google. So there's a business behind that. And again, in our study program, we reflect upon that from both sides. What is the opportunity from a business point of view? For us as university, great, we pay money. Our university comes first when you're looking for computer science in Germany. University of Europe is the first hit. Yes, okay, that's a good thing, right? But for you as human being, you think, well, maybe I'm, well, how, who decides for me what do I see first? Let's think about that. When you are in a new country, maybe you are at a place where I've never been in my life and I want to have a cup of coffee, what do I do? I go on Google Maps and I look for the nearest coffee place. So this is what you see here. This is the area in Hamburg Altona and a coffee place that is not on Google Maps does not exist, right? So the digital world really predefines what we perceive and what the options are for us to go. And this is like the hidden power of Google Maps. And I think it is super important to think, how much do you like your filter bubble? So imagine you are a tech person, you're interested in sports, you're interested in tech and computer and IT, and you have no children. And all of a sudden you get children stuff in your recommendation list of Amazon. Do you really want to have something that is not at all related to your life? Or another example, maybe you are one of these guys you like heavy metal festivals and you are really, really into heavy metal music. And do you really want to have the recommendation of the early Justin Bieber in your recommendation list? I'm not sure. So how much do we really like this? And this is what we're saying. Maybe it makes the life of our customer better to show them what is interesting for them. And it's so many purchases on the internet happen based on recommendation. Maybe we also like to be guided by that, but where are our limits? And this is what we need to discuss. And what is also so interesting is that the algorithm even knows better. So in early times when we wanted to identify the preferences of our customers, we needed to ask them in surveys in interviews. And then what happens is you as human being give self-ideal, socially desirable answers. So what do you do in your free time? I'm reading French literature. And I'm listening to classical music. Maybe you want to say something because it's a socially desirable answer. It's a self-ideal what you have. And maybe you do not want to admit what you're watching on YouTube actually every night. And the algorithm actually identifies that, right? Through, our, through the analytics, on, through bad clicks and through the cookies. Yes, cookies are a real thing. This is why you need to accept them now all the time. Because with cookies, we identify you not with your name, but with your IP, with your internet ID. And then we can identify what kind of a person you are. Again, with all its up, upsides and downsides. And this is what we need to discuss. So what is the responsibility for us to be responsible with this information? And what can we do to provide the individual solution for you that you like? And you know that it's not only your click behavior, it's also what is recorded through your smartphone, through Alexa and other smart home systems. And now we come to a complete game changer in the recent years. Well, it's not so recent, but we had in, in the early system human programmed algorithms. 
So a human programmer sits down and builds an algorithm. And this is what the algorithm does, as I showed you with the sorting algorithm. And now we have machine learning. And this is a new game. Um, not only that uh, we have now AI that can build its own code based on natural language descriptions, alpha code. So if you're interested in this, look up alpha code. This is absolutely amazing and a bit scary because now AI can write own code based on natural language description. Also, we do not really care what is happening inside the program because we have a classification based on input data, pattern, output, reaction. We are not really sure what is happening inside because the machine learning learns on its own based on data. And this, this is super powerful and um, let us show go to an example. So this is hide and seek. Sorry for that. So the red guy here has the task to catch the blue guys. And uh, it gets points for that. And the blue guys get points when they can successfully hide. And in the beginning, it's just random walk. They just walk around randomly, trying things out and well, no one is successful, really. Maybe the seeker is successful. And then they do it over and over again in many thousand simulations. And after a while, they learn a strategy. And after a while, the blue guys learn to hide by door blocking. So using the case, putting it in the door, wow, and the seeker cannot come through. They can do it also with multiple doors, voila, nothing happens. Now the wet guy learns as well. And the wet guy learns to use this ramp that you see over there. Why not using this ramp to go over the blocks and into the blue guys? Now this ramp thing did not happen uh, consciously. It is just random walk, random walk, random walk. And when they found out, wow, putting the box there gives me a lot of points, then this is a strategy that they memorize and the other strategies are left out. And also with the ramp defense, they learn that those ramp defense, the ramp defense is here putting, oh, this is so cute, sorry, I'm talking all the time. So let's now look ramp defense. Bam. So the blue guys put the ramp in before it can be used. Uh, and this is, can happen because the red guys are a bit freezed in the beginning. So the intelligence here that happens is trying out, trying out, and then learning through reinforcement, learning what is a good strategy. And this deep learning is, so you need to imagine we have artificial intelligence as the big headline. Machine learning is one area in it where they learn to adapt to the environment. And in machine learning, you have deep learning. And deep learning is a very powerful form of machine learning. And it is called deep learning because it's a neural network and it has a lot of neurons on a level. So this is why it is deep. And um, a neural network is you see an input layer here with the X and you see the output layer there, there and they just need to learn how they need to weight the information between the neurons to get the right classification. So it is maybe inspired by the neural system of uh, human beings. It's uh, just that you have these, um, weights on the nodes that weight information getting through and then through the weight of information you have the right classification and they are super powerful and they have great results they are also can be challenged so they are very prominently applied for image recognition so this is a way to challenge your classifier is it a puppy or is it a bagel or even better, this one I like even more, is it a chihuahua or a muffin? Super cute. Well, what I want to talk with you about, even though they are super performant, it can they think completely different than we do. When we think, for example, on image classification, um, an algorithm can identify the left two cupcakes as two cakes and the right two cupcakes as cat and dog. It is because they see the picture completely different to us. So they make very unhuman mistakes. So they are not obvious to us. So an algorithm that almost performs 100% can perform differently without us knowing that there's any difference in the input. So texts, 
speeches, music and images can be manipulated in a way that they come to different results without us knowing it. And this is, of course, the security thing that we also talk about. What are lack of securities here and how can they be those be avoided? And let us discuss about those as well. They are so relevant for us, these algorithms. We need to be aware of that. And then they, there's the thing that they learn from training data. So they learn from historical data. And what does that mean for us? The, the most of these algorithms work with frequencies, so they identify something that happens very often, and based on what happens very often, they come to probabilities, what can happen next. And maybe in Google, when you look uh, in Google and you type in what is the, then you have this autofill uh, suggestions, like here, what is the fastest car in the world, meaning of life, etc. And they do it by probabilities based on frequency of occurrences. Like, can you please come? The prediction is here, because that's a very probable response. And this is how the most text mining, uh, digital um, text apps work, by probabilities based on frequencies in training data. So they just identify what happened most often, and then they predict. And uh, what can go wrong um, when you, I'm not an expert in the Turkish language, but I understood when you um, translate Obir doctor, it can be she is a doctor or he is a doctor. So there's no grammatical gender for Obir doctor. It could be both. And in early versions of the Google Translator, it was always translated into he is a doctor and not she is a doctor. So there was a gender bias in the translation software of Google. Yeah, well, and a study in Boston identified this 2016. There were extreme chic occupations for homemaker, nurse, receptionist, librarian, and a lot of he occupations for maestro, skipper, philosopher, captain, etc. Why? Frequencies, right? Frequencies of occurrences lead to high probabilities. So, even though these algorithms are super performant, we need to look what they are performing at. Another big topic that we have, face recognition. There was a face recognition software and face recognition becomes a bigger, bigger thing every month. Microsoft and IBM classifiers had the fewest error rates for light male faces, light female faces, and for darker female, darker male, they had high error rates. So when you had a face from a different cultural heritage than being white, there were high error rates in these systems. And this is what they identified when they put the algorithm back, they rolled out a new algorithm and, and made sure that this doesn't happen anymore. So when you have a trained data, a trained algorithm, you need to take care of what you train it with and whether you take enough care for minorities and errors for minorities maybe in the region where you uh, built this algorithm. If you would have built this algorithm in China, maybe you would have higher error rates for the lighter phase. I don't know. It depends on the training data set. The same happened with Amazon. You cannot imagine how many, uh, we all cannot imagine how many applications go into Amazon every day, right? Everyone wants to work at this company, probably. It's a big tech company. And for tech positions, they screen the CVs with an artificial intelligence before they uh, have a pre-selection of CVs to look at by human beings. This algorithm systematically outruled all female applications because uh, in the past, they mostly had successful hires of males in the tech company because it was just a higher, it was just a minority of female tech applicants in the past and they did not get hired. And this was the result here. It is safe to say that algorithms have on average less bias in their decision making than humans because they are consistent, they do the same all over again, they do just follow the logical rules. But if I make a mistake as a human, it just influences you in this moment, my students tomorrow, right? Only a few people, my colleagues. But one mistake in an algorithm that is rolled out in an app that is rolled out will influence millions potentially when it is a successful app. So if you have a an error in an app like Google, then this will affect millions. 
And this is why we need to talk about this while we're talking about the possibilities. And this is what we do alongside talking about the possibilities for digital business and data science. We talk about the limitations, ethical considerations, and what this really means for the people using it. We in Germany are the most innovative country, according to the World Economic Forum 2019. For um, this whole area of data science, um, we have a good precondition because we are very fast in developing new technology. We are an economic stable country, one of the most stable countries in Europe, and we have traditionally high engineering competencies. Our expertise in engineering is traditionally high. And the ministry in Germany gave out a big funding plan for artificial intelligence in the recent year. So um, we are a good country to study this. We have a lot of big companies and um, we are not that expensive as the English speaking country, but we are as successful, I would say. Now, when you study with us at the University of Europe, you can either go to Berlin Potsdam to study this. It's uh, the UE Innovation Hub. And here you see a picture of the nice building that we have. So there we have our newest building at the university where you can um, study the IT and data science related programs. I'm located in Hamburg. Hamburg is the second largest city, only one and a half hours away from Berlin. It's a nice harbor city. And on the bottom left, you see the building that I'm sitting in and work there. We have a nice family atmosphere. Our courses are not super big. We are very well connected to the companies in Hamburg. We are super situated right in the center of Hamburg. So it's a very nice community. And um, we are very successful also in the employability rate in general at UE and also in particular here in Hamburg. And um, this is just, just a few silly pictures from my lectures. Um, you see on the top left, we went to the Google Zukunftswerkstatt. It's a workshop in Hamburg with Google where I went with a few students. Here you see how we develop algorithms. So sometimes we even use papers on the on the bottom left, you see uh, we use network optimization by analyzing what is the fastest route to visit each other. And uh, if you want to visit each other, what would be the fastest road? Just to show you that we are very applied and very lively in our lectures. We are live, interactive, uh, really with a personal touch. We see our students. We are not in this hierarchical um, scheme. Of course, there's respect from both sides. And of course, the professor evaluates the students, but it is overall a very nice and constructive atmosphere because we all want the same. We want to our students to improve their skills, to be the best they can, and to find their way for a, for a great career. And this is what we want for our students. And if someone is struggling, falling out, there's a personal discussion and we just see our students and we take care of each other. And this is what I really value. And this is why I really enjoy being there. I have been to big state universities before, but this is really what I like. Now we also have projects for companies. Um, this is just a pitch of one project with Daimler. It was on a communication strategy for a digital product and how they can communicate this in the best possible way. Uh, for the teams. Um, we now and then get data sets from an app company. It's not only the big app companies, there are also small app companies that we should analyze data for and give them the results back. And, and so next to the interactive and applied interaction between professor and student in the classroom, we also have a close connection to the companies. We also have partly professors like I am and partly professors coming from the businesses. and teaching what they do every day in their business so that we really, we are close to what is happening in the industry. Yeah, this is also something that we did uh, over the past two years that we built up our digital campus. And this uh, digital campus is not only um, for um, Zoom or Teams, we are all connected with Office 365 on Teams, so we could right away go into digital teaching after the pandemic started, no matter what. We also had this, and this is a system where we meet each other as avatars. So my students and I, we all have avatars. This is my office in the digital office in this, um, Vibella is the system, and there um, we can meet as well. So it's a different way of meeting each other, interacting with each other, etc. 
So a lot of information on this slides, but as you can see, I come to an end. The good thing is you can look me up also on social media and on LinkedIn. And what you can see there is actually my posts and you see what is actually happening. So you see there's sometimes photos from our university, from the interaction with the students. You see some stories where you can click on and see some of the interactions with the students and some postings. So you can really look up there what is going on. And yeah, I. I thank you very much for listening to me. I was quite fast, as I can see now. <laughs> sometimes I'm faster in speaking, sometimes I'm slower. Um, I hope it was interesting for you. And I think we have now a moment to talk about. I also brought the curriculum with me if you want to have a look at these. So we have digital business and data science on the one hand and a data science master on the other. So both programs uh, prepare you in the best possible way for what I just described. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Iris. That was very interesting. So uh, now we can move on to the Q&A session. So if you guys have any questions, please do leave them in the uh, Q&A chat box below, and we're going to be answering all your questions. Thank you, Saida, for the very nice feedback. <laughs> Okay, Can so, you, yeah. yeah, we have the first question. Uh, Basim is asking, can a student with a research master degree in law apply or it is restricted to a business background, uh, background only? So I think it's the question whether you can start the master degree in data science when you have a bachelor in law, right? Uh, Basim, I yes. think this is it. Um, I think we need to look at the law degree um, because basically it's a, it says business or tech. This is basically our admission requirement for the master in data science. It says business bachelor or tech bachelor, but you never know. I would at least um, have a look at the curriculum and, and really check it in the individual case. You never know. All oh, right. thank you, Ismahana. Thank you. <laughs> I know you guys have a lot of questions, so you can just drop them in the Q&A chat box. freelancing opportunities I see here from Hazem, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what we do with our curriculum is to prepare you um, with all the skills that you need. And uh, usually from the second uh, semester on, you have at least uh, the skills that you can start uh, working. Um, basically, our students are able to work alongside their studies, and we even advise that to do so. Um, of course, it's um, you need to work and to study at the same time and you need to make sure that this works well. Um, usually um, employers are um, flexible and they know about the needs of a student, but um, most of our students are also working and this you can do at a company or as a freelancer. When it is really about the skills, then of course you need to wait the first two semesters or so to have the basic skills to start to do your own projects. Um, we also have a very active career center and this career center helps you alongside many dimensions. It uh, provides workshops uh, to support you. It also helps you in individual consultancy um, to um, think with you about options for you. We have also a platform where we publish internship positions. Internship positions come also often through our professor staff or the adjunct lecturers for the good students. I always tell them, be a good student from the beginning on, show yourself and then uh, job opportunities come to you. Otherwise your career center can help you to find opportunities. Mona, did you want to? at something or did I say it all? You answered, you actually gave the answer I wanted to give. It's about the, the, the career services. And just one more bit I want to add is that the services that they offer are free of charge for all our students. So that's it. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, so someone is asking what should the beginner focus on? So I believe uh, it really depends on your education level for now. Like for instance, if you're still in high school, I would suggest going on to study a bachelor's degree in data science, for instance. Um, if you are already finished a relevant bachelor degree, you could maybe do a master's, for instance. Exactly. And um, we do not accept that anyone is able to program for the bachelor degree. Um, so in the bachelor degree, you will learn programming in Python and in R, which are the most relevant languages. For the master, we expect you to have some coding skill, but we have a pre-course programming. So if you need to have the skill, then uh, we can help you with a pre-course that you can do with us. And um, yeah, I mean, this is uh, our idea is that you learn everything what you need to learn in the bachelor program. And uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm just adding. Uh, we're actually taking applications for the September intake. So as Karam said, depending on where you are in your studies, whether you're finishing up your high school or um, you want to apply for a master's degree, uh, now is a good time to reach out to Karam and his team in Education Basket. And <laughs> you have to get accepted in order for this to be an option for you. So. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for the Julia question. Amazing. Um, so Python is really a high programming language. It's on the same level as Java, C++. So they are really unlimited opportunities. So these are really the big powerful tools. And traditionally, we are, right now we find in data science uh, mainly Python and R, while Python gets more prominent now than R uh, slightly. And also Julia. And Julia is really a programming language that is uh, prepared for data analytics and data science purposes, and at least a very interesting programming language and to be looked at. And what we do right now, because we um, want to be always right at the time and what is going on in the companies needs to be included. So in my big data and analytics uh, lecture that I just started yesterday, um, I teach them R, but I also invite from Statista the colleague who comes towards the end of the semester for two languages to give an introduction to Julia as well. And then we will discuss how much is Julia better, what can be done with Julia that cannot be done with R, et cetera. So we will discuss this in our lecture and uh, keep always an eye on the recent developments in the field. All right, are there any other questions? Well, we have here an formal answer and a general answer, right? <laughs> So if the question is related to the master program, we have statistics and programming as um, admission, admission requirements. And of course we can help you to achieve that because we have a pre-course in statistics and a pre-course in programming. Um, you should have um, a structured mindset. You should like structure and logic and you should be curious and you should like to dig into data, do the analytics and find things out. So some curiosity, some structural mindset, thinking and logic, and having also fun in doing some detective work, I would say. And um, being a very structured person and like to have clean pictures. And um, this, this would be some description from my part. But I have really various personalities. Can I work with Python only? Um, you mean doing your studies. Uh, so we teach you Python and R because they are just required for you to have the skill set. Um, later on, when you develop further, um, you can, of course, say, OK, I pick Python as the programming language that I want to be an expert in. And uh, this, I think most of us have one language that they feel most comfortable in. I mean, I'm really 
trained in Java and I did a lot of things in Java already, but I also fall in love with Python and R. Um, but um, so we make sure that you have the skill set that you need, that you have an understanding of R and Python and also Java to some extent, but you can then develop with one program to be an expert. I think that you're referring to object-oriented programming, Hazem. I hope that I understand you with, uh, right. So object-oriented programming is just one um, aspect of the higher programming language Python that we, of course, will consider and which is in particular relevant for um, some app programming and some uh, online programming. But this is just one programming concept of many that we will discuss. So. It's, it's, it's just as, as relevant as in many other applications. All right, so I think that's mainly it for today. Thank you very much, Professor Iris, and thank you very much, Ms. Mona, for joining us today. And uh, thank you, everyone, actually, for joining us uh, in today's session as well. And we actually hope to see you all again uh, in our last session for the summit uh, this uh, Friday uh, at the same time as well. Thank you all, and thank you, Kazam. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.